Let me say that I am uh, very pleased in uh, introducing the lecture by uh, Professor Vigato. I have a look to her uh, curriculum and I found uh, 62 pages. Uh, two pages only for um, honors and words. And uh, uh, words, excuse me. She has uh, dedicated uh, all her life um, to study the sex specific aspects of cardiovascular disease. And this is the topic of uh, her lecture, and I am eager to listen to it. Please, Professor Legato. Thank you very much, Dr. Caraccioli, for the opportunity to be here, and thank you to the Foundation for inviting me, and complimenti to the Scientific Committee. In the half hour or so that I will be speaking with you, I would like to review some of the changes that have happened in cardiovascular medicine over the past 30 years. We knew, but have really begun to investigate the basis for gender-specific differences in the prevalence of disease, about the impact of sex hormones on disease susceptibility, pathophysiology, and the outcome of illness. We have become, of course, since the year 2000 particularly, interested in the differences in the genetic architecture of men and women. And we know now that the very same genes are expressed differently in all the tissues of the body as a consequence of whether the propositus is male or female. We are also becoming more interested in probable differences in the epigenetic impact of experience on phenotype. As Gillian Einstein has put it, the world writes on the body through the mechanism of modification of the genetic code, and the resulting phenotype is an amalgam of genes and the impact of the environment through epigenetic mechanisms on the expression of those genes. I'd like to point out and discuss the highlights of four different periods in biomedical investigation that began after World War II and the rise of feminism. The women of the Western world petitioned the uh, biomedical community to investigate the gender disparity in the treatment of cardiovascular disease between men and women. And in 1989 and 90, the investigation began of the nature of those differences. And the science of what we have called gender-specific medicine was born. In the early research of that decade, we understood that the hearts of men and women were distinctly different more so as we began to look. And we correctly surmised that if the hearts were different, then there are probably differences. There were probably differences in all the organs of the body, and that came to be so. I will talk to you this evening about the expanding information about the different experience of cardiovascular disease, primarily from the clinical point of view <clears throat> between men and women. In 2000, the era of the genome began with the description of the structure of the human genome. And we are engaged now in the exponential expansion of information 
about the molecular basis of all gender-specific normal physiology and of the pathophysiology of disease. And I'll try to discuss some of the important observations made about the genetic underlying uh, scaffolding, if you will, of the difference between men and women's myocardial biology. I'll discuss with you briefly, from about 2006 to the present, the fantastic intervention or appearance of CRISPR-9, which made it clear that we could actually alter the genetic code, and the possibility arose of preventing or curing myocardial disease at the genomic level. That science is, as I said, expanding exponentially, and it is probably one of the most exciting, intriguing, and baffling and frustrating areas of biomedical research by the cardi cardiovascular community. I'd like to really sum up the crux of the issue for you with this quotation, which you can read from the slide. But women have less anatomical obstructive coronary disease and relatively preserved left ventricular function, and yet they have greater rates of myocardial ischemia and mortality compared with similarly aged men. The questions I'd like to ask you to help us answer, and you are answering them, obviously, in your own scholarship, is the pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease significantly different in men and women? And the answer is that sex is an extremely potent modifier of the cardiovascular system. What we call coronary artery disease actually represents a whole complex of disorders in the myocardial arterial circulation, many of which overlap or coexist. And the proposal is that we should use a better term instead of coronary disease and call it ischemic heart disease. I'd like to start with some gender-specific clinical features of cardiovascular disease. And what are the causes, what are the questions we should be asking about sex-based differences in ischemic heart disease and the susceptibility of some patients to that disease? Is there a difference between men and women in the underlying cause of the ischemia? Is there possibly a difference in the very cells of the myocardium that can alter the response of the cell to a, an attenuation of blood supply? And of course, what is the role of hormones? It is not as universal as you might suppose, but it plays obviously a tremendously significant part in the modification of the experience of all cardiovascular disease. And is the role of hormones the same, or does it change with age? Is ischemic heart disease the same disease in both sexes? No. There are autonomic features, there are the protective effects of hormones, and there is an entirely different impact of risk factors on men and women. Men have a natural vulnerability with greater sympathetic activity of the myocardium. There is obviously a protective effect of hormones. The disease begins in men with clinical symptoms at about the age of 35, and women get a relative immunity from ischemic heart disease until the menopause. The results, by the way, of the studies of hormones on women, whether they should be prescribed, the role they played, and the consequences of hormone therapy, have really been completely revised and then re-revised as a result of the famous Women's Health Initiative and the HERS study in the United States. And we'll talk about that and the indications and timing of hormone therapy. Fundamentally, it is inappropriate ever to use hormonal replacement therapy in the postmenopausal woman to ameliorate or to prevent cardiovascular disease. The impact of risk factors is extremely striking in its differences uh, between men and women. 
diabetic women's risk for myocardial infarction is enhanced or increased by sixfold diabetic compared with men. Men have a threefold increase of risk. Women who are diabetic uh, and have their myocardial infarction have a higher mortality and a higher incidence of heart failure. Hypertension is particularly interesting because of its sex-flavored differences. There is a higher incidence in elderly women than in elderly men. And there is a gene on the Y chromosome that regulates increased renin-angiotensin activity in men. LVH, therefore, in men responds better to angiotensin inhibitors than do women. Hypertriglyceridemia is a bigger risk factor for women. And women have a particular and intense susceptibility to smoking. And as we'll talk about in detail a little bit later, it has an enormous impact on the state of the microcirculation, even in women without demonstrable macrocoronary disease. Men are more likely to have an elevated CK and troponins, which mark necrosis as a biomarker for their um, non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. Women are more uh, marked, if you will, or have a marker for an elevated CRP, which is, as you know, a marker of inflammation and a higher level of BNP, an indication of myocardial heart failure. What are the implications of, of those different biomarkers? Is it a difference in the pathophysiology of ischemic heart disease? I'd like to talk a little bit about the myocardial circulation and its division into three segments, depending on the size of the vessels. The large epicardial arteries are capacitance vessels, and their diameter and tone is largely regulated by nitrous oxide. The second compartment, uh, according to descending size, is the pre-arteriolar vessels, and their function is to keep the pressure of blood delivered to the arterioles, so crucial in matching blood supply to metabolic needs, um, within a narrow range. And finally, the intramural art arterioles are terribly important. They match the metabolic needs of the myocardium to oxygen supply. All three of the systems can be individually malfunctioning, and disease in one system is not the same as disease in the others. <clears throat> Cardiovascular, cardiac microvascular dysfunction, or CMD, occurs in four settings. In the absence of myocardial disease, this is particularly important for women who, when they smoke, have a 22% increased risk on coronary flow reserve as a function of the impact on the microvasculature. In the presence of myocardial disease, the um, microvascular dysfunction pro produces adverse remodeling of the arterioles, particularly in primary cardiac genetic myopathies. Arterioles are remodeled, and there is external compression of the microcirculation by hypertrophied or fibrotic myocardium. CMD can also occur in the presence of obstructive coronary disease and can occur with stable coronary disease and be responsible for ischemia even when the disease in the large coronary vessels is stable. And finally, there is a disorder of the microvascular circulation produced by us when we treat uh, plaque with distal embolization after coronary recanalization. Women have a particular profile of the pathology of coronary microvascular dysfunction. They have less obstructive anatomic coronary disease and relatively well-preserved left ventricular function compared with men. We talked about the WISE study, which described and highlighted for the first time women with nonspecific chest pain and no obstructive coronary disease who nevertheless had increased mortality rates. They have abnormal coronary reactivity 
microvascular dysfunction, and plaque erosion with distal microembolization. Their risk factors are novel and striking and different from that of men. They have high triglyceride and CRP levels, and women who have premenopausal estrogen fluctuation are particularly susceptible to coronary microvascular dysfunction. The stress CMR uniquely measures subendocardial perfusion, and what treatment we have is important to note that nitrates and beta blockers fail, sometimes treatment with nifedipine, calcium channel blocker is effective. The genetic locus for risk for microvascular dysfunction, interestingly enough, seems to be different in men and women and involve two susceptibility genes which are quite different between the sexes. There are also sex-specific differences in the cellular composition of the myocardium. Most appear only after puberty and imply and introduce, if you will, the important regulatory effect of sex hormones on myocardial function. There are interesting data from the RAT model, which showed sex-related differences in gene expression in rat ventricular cells that only appeared after puberty. The important protein relaxin mediates normal diastolic ventricular function. And in knockout relaxin-deficient mice, adult males only developed atrial hypertrophy and an increase in ventricular collagen content and stiffness. Genes have an important effect on coronary artery spasm. <clears throat> NADH, NADPH plays a role in oxidative stress in the vessel wall and is related to the prevalence of coronary artery spasm in men. MMP3 and IL-6 are involved in vascular matrix metabolism and inflammation, and those genes play an important role for coronary artery spasm in women. There is a gender-specific response to pressure overload hypertrophy. In response to such hypertrophy, women develop a small cavity size and a thickened, symmetrically thickened ventricular wall with superior efficiency of ejection. Men produce a dilated ventricle, often asymmetrically proportioned, and have a deteriorated systolic function. In women, there is an increased transcriptional activation of collagen over other extracellular myocyte components, which is an important reason for the wall thickness and for diastolic dysfunction. Women recruit myosin light chain, which regulates assembly and contractility of sarcomeric proteins during sarcomerogenesis and in pressure overload, overload hypertrophy more than men, and hence they have relatively better systolic function. And then we should talk about TGF-beta-1, which promotes fibrosis and remodels cardiac cells in aortic stenosis by regulating the activity of genes that encode sarcomeric proteins MIIC and MLC2. Its effects are mediated by different intracellular signal, signaling pathways in men and women. In men, the genes expressing extracellular fibrosis are activated, and in women, those that promote the production of sarcomeric proteins. Menopause for women involves a striking and sometimes sudden change in cardiovascular physiology and indeed in physiology as a whole. Clustering of risk factors suddenly may appear after menopause and particularly important are obesity, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. There is obviously intricate regulation of the cardiovascular system by the hormones, and in the case of estrogen, polymorphisms in the estrogen receptor are associated with increased hypertrophy in response to hypertension in women, adiposity in men, and susceptibility to infarction in both sexes. Estrogens operate primarily 
by an altered expression of genes. It reduces calcium load in ischemia via alteration in the L-type calcium channel. It upregulates up nitrous oxygen synthesis, decreases connexin levels by translocating it to mitochondria, and upregulates prostaglandin and mitochondrial function and downregulates procollagen production. I remember reading the original paper in 2002 on this fascinating phenomenon of Takotsubo disease, which was seen in the 19 patients in which it was originally described in women, with one exception. And women, when they undergo an emotionally taxing challenge, can be positive or negative, seem to have the sudden onset of global left ventricular dysfunction. It is called Takotsubo, as you can see, because of its relevance to the octopus traps. The shape of the heart is not unlike those octopus traps. The octopus goes into the trap, and because of the interference of its many arms, cannot escape, so it's called Takotsubo. It occurs principally in elderly women, and the area of hypokinesis occurs in a very specific part of the left ventricle, from the mid portion to the apical area, and hyperkinesis of the basal area of the left ventricle. The symptoms resemble acute myocardial infarction and, and are complete with EKG changes, but the dysfunction is transient and usually recovery occurs within 24 hours up to a month long, and I have personally seen two patients of my own with this syndrome. It's remarkable, and the pathophysiology remains a complete mystery. Testosterone is also important in the regulation of myocardial activity, <clears throat> and in men with high levels, it ensures that they will have good levels of HDL their triglycerides will be low, as will their total cholesterol levels. Low levels of testosterone produce insulin, resistant, in, insulin resistance and promote the development of type 2 diabetes. Testosterone has a direct effect on the heart by the modulation of vascular tone by a non-genomic pathway independent of endothelial function and it increases myocardial perfusion and reduces coronary ischemia in men with coronary disease. There are no data that I could find, perhaps some of you are aware of it, of some, about the impact of testosterone therapy on the development of coronary disease, whether it pre uh, pre uh, prevents it or makes it happen earlier. But in general, the effect of therapy of testosterone is related to the conversion, obviously, of testosterone to estrogen by aromatase. Now, there will be a whole lecture uh, in the course of the conference uh, on diastolic dysfunction, but I think it's one of the most interesting symptoms that mark the difference between men and women. And it is essentially heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. More than half of patients with, with heart failure have this syndrome, and th it has three features. It has the symptoms of heart failure with normal systolic left ventricular function and evidence of left ventricular diastolic function with impaired filling. 40 to 71 percent of these patients um, uh, occur in the uh, 40, 40 to 71%, sorry, of these patients are female and represent between 1 and 5% of the general population. The typical patient with this syndrome is an elderly woman with a high incidence of comorbidities, especially women with hypertension, diabetes, and these women are fascinatingly less likely to have coronary artery disease. The mortality is higher with HFPEF, higher than heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. And indeed, there may be many subsets 
of these patients. Women, as I've told you, have a different response to hypertension, but point three under the women column, they have diastolic stif stif stiffness that is persistently higher at any age. And there is a prolonged time in these patients for enhanced apical rotation as the heart contracts, which pulls blood from the atrium into the ventricle, and loss in the long axis diastolic lengthening velocity above the age of 60. The contribution of non-diastolic factors to this syndrome is complicated. There is a primary role of volume expansion in precipitating this syndrome. It precedes symptoms and is associated with reduced glomerular filtration rate and greater neuroendocrine activation. The treatment is, of course, venous bed expansion and diuresis. There is increased arterial stiffness and reduced distensibility to the arterial vessels and chronotropic incompetence, a blunted increase in rate response to exertion and a prolonged decline after exercise in heart rate. The treatment suggests that beta blockers are contraindicated and there is obviously a possible role of impaired nitrous oxide release. And finally, we come to the new period in cardiovascular exploration and research. <clears throat> and that is the status of what we have been able to learn in the last uh, 15 years about gender-specific cardiovascular disease at the genomic or molecular level. <laughs> the world was bright with promise in 2000 with the benefits of what we would learn from exploring the genome, from manipulating the genome, and for understanding how the genome, in all its apparent simplicity in terms of structure, governed human physiology. In fact, it has been one of the most complex, confusing, and ever-expanding in complexity disciplines that we have yet pursued. There are several very exciting new elements in genetic manipulation and investigation. The first is the dazzling discovery described as CRISPR-Ca9 and techniques associated with this in which we know that we can target, delete, and even insert genes into the genetic sequence. It is also beginning to be of interest to target and investigating the role of so-called non-coding regions of the genome using this very powerful technique. To date, there has been no uh, acknowledgement of the fact that the impact of CRISPR in a man and a woman, a male and a female, can be different. And one of the interesting roles in life that I have assumed is to remind the molecular biologists that what is true at the macro level is probably true and should be considered at the molecular level. We are now able to track single molecules in live cells that just came out before I left New York in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And there, is, there has been for some time non-invasive chromosome screening of human embryos by genome sequencing of embryo culture medium rather than uh, threatening the integrity of the embryo itself. The most exciting new idea comes, as usual, from George Church at MIT and his associates, and he has proposed recreating the entire human genome. And his project is called the Human Genome Writing Project, and if you ever want to uh, to believe that science fiction has now come into the reality of biomedical investigation, read Dr. Church's fantastic descriptions of his proposal, and he thinks that within 10 years we will be creating to design human uh, viable genomes. An interesting sidelight I thought I would talk to you about is the data from the BHF FH, F and the WASCOP studies, which were all done exclusively in men. And they showed the relevance of genes on the Y chromosome to uh, uh, the uh, 
prevalence of or the uh, occurrence of coronary artery disease, and they found that there were two haplotypes of non, nine identified uh, genes which accounted for 90% of the variation in the Y chromosome. The first of these was significantly more associated with CAD than controls. And the action of this haplotype group is probably mediated through a genetically programmed profile of immunity and inflammation. Genetic studies for ischemic heart disease are hampered by the pathophysiology because it is not the same in both genders. And what may be true of males in terms of their genetics uh, who have ischemic heart disease may not hold for that of women. Abnormal coronary reactivity, microvascular dysfunction, and plaque erosion are all, as I have said, more difficult uh, more characteristic of heart disease in women compared with men. The present studies, because of their complexity and cumbersome nature, lack, in many cases, adequate statistical power to account for sex differences, and this continues to, to limit valid data. Again, people are so enchanted with the idea of finding any genetic basis for disease that they have not yet moved to consider whether, as it has historically been true, their findings will be different for the two sexes. There is a bias against reporting negative results, which I'm sorry it exists because it would be helpful. And then the nature, South America versus North America, and the size of the population study vary. To find a genome-wide association for an analysis of coronary disease, which as yet has been untouched by the notion that that association may be different in men and women, uh, is really lacking. I told you about the two complementary genome-wide association studies. The two studies found the same locus in both with the strongest association with coronary disease, and that was on chromosome. 9P213. In one study, nine loci were strongly associated with coronary disease, but only two were successfully replicated in the German study. But when they combined the data from the both studies, they found a significant association with coronary, coronary disease in four additional loci. So you see, it's complicated. Uh, the scientific planning or the planning of these investigations is limited, and the challenge, I think, continues to be enormous. So there are limitations of current genetic data in discerning gender differences in all complex diseases. The present data, first of all, do not indicate frequent, large, sex-specific variation in established loci for complex diseases. There may be differences between the two sexes due to complex gene and environment interactions not captured by current methodology, and these can only be, be uh, explored through much larger studies with accurate data on environmental exposure, which has such an important impact on genetic expression and function. And finally, it will not pick up, and has not so far picked up, rare variations in genetic effects between men and women. We need, and this remains a huge barrier and challenge, much larger studies with accurate data on environmental exposure and studies which are extensive enough to capture rare variant profiles in these larger populations. Thank you very much for your attention.